Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, South Florida Hospital News and Healthcare Report, uh, kind of lunch and learn series. Uh, for the next hour, we're gonna have Mark Eagler uh, talk to us about taxes. Uh, maybe a topic that you like, maybe a topic that you don't like, uh, but it's a topic that is on everybody's mind right now, especially with April 15th coming around the corner. Uh, Mark is gonna give us a, uh, a, an understanding of what to look for in your taxes this year. And even if you don't prepare your own taxes, what you need to know when you talk to your tax advisor. So with that, uh, Mark, if you wanna introduce yourself. Absolutely, good afternoon. Thank you guys for uh, spending a little, bit, a little bit of your lunch hour with me today this afternoon. Um, as Charles said, my name is Mark Egord. I've been a practitioner in public accounting for over 30 years. We pump out a lot of tax work. Um, my goal today is really just to kind of demystify a few things as far as how we organize information, some definitions and terms. And as you're preparing information, maybe for yourself, if you do the tax for yourself, or if you prepare information for your accountant, just want to talk about what those documents are, maybe what they mean, why they're important. Uh, maybe bring up, uh, you know, some other esoteric terms that, that might apply to you or not. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, just first and foremost is, you know, and, and I'm sure you're all good with this. Um, I'm, we're not giving tax advice today. What we're doing is just giving an overview. So if you have, you know, any specific tax advice type questions, talk to your accountant, call me separately. And, you know, we can talk about it outside this forum. But just today, I want to give an overview of uh, just kind of the framework of, of how we define income, how we define deductions, how we document those things. Um, so we'll get started. Um, Charles, next slide. So let's, let's talk about gross income, just in the overall sense, the 30,000 foot view of gross income, as far as the Internal Revenue Service is concerned, is pretty much everything you receive. Um, whether it's for services, whether it's for you know passive income, portfolio income, you are required to report all income. I do have clients that come to me and say, well, what about cash? And I say, well, what about cash? Cash is still income. So my license and our professional responsibilities require us to tell you, you must report everything. Um, so sources of income will include things, you know, portfolio income, compensation in the forms of your W-2, uh, maybe sale of capital assets, um, income received from flow through entities that you might be a shareholder in or have a partnership in. All of those items are income and then we aggregate all that report that capital gains. Uh, also, you know, for sale of maybe stock or other capital assets, all those are, are income. So we, we put that all together. The documents that you might use. So for example, the easiest document, if you are an employee anywhere, you'll receive a W-2. You know that your W-2 is, is what records your compensation and taxes withheld on that. Um, other forms of income might include, so if you're a social security recipient, maybe in, in the year of COVID, you got unemployment benefits. These are all things that will get included in your income. You know, an unemployment benefits is a, um, you know, it's interesting if you're if you're not familiar with the form that they give, you have to read that form very carefully. The so the state of Florida will issue you what's called a 1099G, I believe it is, and for unemployment benefits, there's oftentimes taxes are not withheld on that, and I do have taxpayers that are confused about the inclusion of unemployment benefits. But the fact is, unemployment benefits are supposed to replace wages that you would have normally earned and reported. So those are taxable. Um, but you have to be careful if you're preparing your own return and you received unemployment benefits, you have to be careful about how you input the information because there is a, uh, there, there are many tax terms we've looked at um, that when you put the information in the wrong box because there's some confusion in terms of, you know, amounts repaid versus amounts actually received, it actually ends up being a, a credit or a reduction in your income. So you really need to be careful and look at it holistically. Um, also, just, I, I don't know if Charles mentioned, um, because we're a small group, if there's something I'm talking about and you want to get a little bit more clarity on, uh, Charles, it's okay. They can, they, they can bounce in with the question. Does that, does that work for you? Uh, yes. I, anytime you have a question, just kind of unmute yourself. You have a very small group. Uh, and just okay. ask the question to Mark. Uh, I'm sure if you're asking a question, somebody else probably is thinking that anyway. So go ahead and just pop in with it. Okay. Terrific. 
All right, let's move on to um, our next page, our next slide. So the the first the first item of income we talked about was, was essentially compensation, forms of compensation, mostly in, in uh, the form of a W-2. The other items that go beneath that, we have investment income. It's often also referred to as portfolio income. So we have things, you know, dividends and, and interest income. So if you have a, um, so for example, a brokerage account, um, at all these, you know, E-Trade or, or, or Charles Schwab or whatever it is, um, if your accounts are earning dividends and, uh, and earning interest, they'll be reported on there. There'll be a form 1099-DIV, 1099-DIV. That's where your dividends will be reported. Interest income will also be reported there. I have had taxpayers come to me with these forms, 1099 DIV forms, for example, and they'll ask, I don't understand. I didn't actually receive this money. Why do I still have to pay tax on it? And I'll show them the document. Oftentimes those dividends get reinvested. When those dividends are reinvested, they still count as income to you because the fancy term for that is called an increase in basis. We're not gonna discuss that today, but um, just because you didn't actually receive it in cash does not mean it is not a taxable event for, for the recipient. All right. Um, interest income, generally interest income is, is also taxable as ordinary income. There are some components of interest that may not be taxable for federal purposes. Um, so you speak to your tax advisor about that. Examples might be, you know, interest on municipals. Um, some other tax exempt interest items might be reported on there that while we do have to report that, it's not the same thing as having it rise to the level of taxable income. Um, rents and royalties. So what you're gonna prepare for your tax preparer for yourself if you have, let's say rental property. Rental property has its own schedule. There's a, a schedule, it's called Schedule E. And we accumulate all the, all the rental income and all the costs associated with deriving that rental income, all right? The interesting thing about rent is that we, we in the same way as we talk about portfolio income, it's considered what's called passive income. And passive income is treated differently for tax purposes than income we receive actively, like compensation. Um, so without getting into the minutia of it, um, but I'll give you examples of conversations that I'll have with clients about, hey, I have a, a, a rental loss, how can I take advantage of that? And there, because it's considered passive, there are limitations on those losses. Um, one limitation is that because it's passive, passive activity losses are limited to $25,000 per year. However, you can offset passive activity losses with any passive act, with any passive income. Passive income examples of that might be if you are a member in a limited liability company, but you're not actively participating in its management. Um, but going back to and another example of where passive limitations might affect a taxpayer is if your income is over a certain threshold, I believe the amount is $150,000, if you do have losses in passive activities such as rental, you will not be able to take advantage of that loss in the current year. Those losses become what is called suspended. And so you wanna make sure that you're tracking those suspended losses because there are opportunities at some other point to take advantage of those losses. All right. Mark? Yes. What is a non-corporate shareholder when you're talking about dividend income? A non-corporate shareholder is an individual, like, like you and I are non-corporate. We're not entities. We're, we're okay. individuals. That makes sense. So, yeah. So yeah, the distinction is such where if a corporation is actually the shareholder, th there's different treatments for those types of dividends. That's a good question. Thanks. My pleasure. Um, any questions about the rents and royalties and, and before I move on to uh, Social Security and unemployment? We're good there. All right. So the only thing I want to discuss on Social Security benefits, um, just a couple of things. One, the documents you're going to put together for that is just the 1099 SA. Um, the a lot of my taxpayers who receive Social Security benefits are also still working, 
or they had income from other sources. So what that does, so by way of example, if I, I, I have a taxpayer we're preparing a tax return for, and the only income they have is their social security benefits. None of that will be subject to, to, uh, to income tax. The vast majority of my clients who do have social security benefits are either still employed or have other sources of income. What that does do is it elevates their social security benefits to a tier of making it taxable. There's two different tiers depending upon how much income they have from other sources. So it's either going to be where the income from social security benefits is either, either half of it is includable in income or up to 85% of that is includable in income. Um, in the, from a planning standpoint, what I've advised my clients to do is if, if, at the very, if they are taxed where 85% of their social security income is being taxed, I do suggest to them that they have uh, a portion of that withheld for tax purposes. Usually we'll look at their effective tax rate after a tax return is completed. I might tell them to withhold 15% or 20% or just something because that income is contributing to their taxable, you know, their taxable income. So I want to make sure that there's no surprises there that they're leveraging, you know, the withholdings that are necessary for that. Um, again, I know we talked about unemployment compensation. Unemployment, again, there's a, a form 1099-G. That is a form that we're, we'll put together. Uh, that is a form that you would give to your tax preparer. There are no offsets for social security benefits and there are no offsets for unemployment income. There's no self-employment schedule. There's no uh, reduction in unemployment benefits for job uh, search or anything like that which I've had clients ask me about if there's any, any way we can offset that income. There's not. It, it almost functions the same way as a W-2 would. Okay. I'm going to spend a few minutes on self-employment income. This is an area that um, I often find provides a surprise for, for clients and, and understandable because so self-employment income is its own category of income. And it, it carries a separate component of tax. So in addition to income tax that you will pay on the net amount of your self-employment income, and we'll discuss how to net that, um, there is also a, a, a there's also self-employment tax. So just as a reminder of what that looks like, if you are an employee of a company that pays you as a W-2 employee and you have a paycheck from there, you will, you know, you will look and see that. Uh, a portion of your pay is withheld for Social Security and Medicare tax. That is 7.65% of your gross, and that's what gets withheld. So you are paying in Social Security and Medicare. What you may not know is that behind the scenes, your employer is matching that. So you pay half, your employer pays half. That's one of the employee benefits, if you will, of being employees that you don't have to be uh, responsible for all 15.3%. So your employer pays and you pay. When you are self-employed, you are responsible for both components, employer and employee portion of the self-employment tax. That often comes as a, as a surprise to some of my clients who have entered into you know, a single member LLC or they've done doing business as a sole proprietor. And so that pushes their effective income tax rate much higher than 30%, if you will, when you factor in the, the self-employment tax. Now, Half of that self-employment tax is a deduction from income, but that's only in the income tax side, not the self-employment tax side. So self-employment income. If you hold yourself out in a trade or business, whether professional services, whether it's trades, whatever it might be, and you are earning income through that, <clears throat> remember these incomes that you earn are not subject to any withholdings, meaning your clients or your customers will issue you a check and it's gonna be up to you to pay in the income taxes on that. Typically we do that quarterly. Um, so what do we need to do to put together this information? So when you are a sole proprietor or a single member LLC, and for those not familiar, a single member limited liability company um, the fancy term for that, that the IRS considers you as a disregarded entity for tax purposes. And all that means is if you're a single member LLC, there's, there's no compliance. There's no additional compliance other than what you would have done as a sole proprietor on your personal tax return. You will file what's called a Schedule C and you will accumulate 
you accumulate the data separately. So for example, you will have to indicate all the, all the monies that you earned at the gross level. So all the checks, cash, however you got paid, you report that at the top line. The good news is, is that to the extent that there was a cost to generate that revenue, for the most part, you can deduct it. There might be certain examples of things that um, have a different tax treatment. And we'll, we'll address that in a minute. But if you incur expenses to generate that self-employment income, we categorize that or you categorize that, you summarize that information and we deduct it. What are some examples? Examples might be supplies, special software, if you have to pay for certain licensing or continuing education. Um, if you take out your favorite client to a steak dinner, we can deduct half of that as long as you document that correctly your business phone, your telephone, your communications, internet, website, collateral pieces, business cards, um, special insurance, anything that you incur that was, you know, for the generation of that income, we can deduct that against the self-employment income to come up with a net self-employment income tax to come up with a self-employment income number, which would be subject to the SE tax. Um, Biggest question I get is, what about my car? Well, what about our car? So let's talk about the car, because that is um, that is an allowable deduction. So if you are using your car for business, meaning that you're driving from your home location, assuming that you don't have an office to go to, to your clients, to your work site, to the bank, to a meeting, whatever it is, the business use of that car, we can deduct. There are two ways to deduct that. Both of those ways that I'll describe to you require the same documentation. That documentation is a mileage log. Um, I believe that there are more advanced techn technological ways to keep mileage tracking these days. Um, I don't know how well that has been tested with, I with the IRS as far as their audit procedures are concerned. But I will tell you that if you deduct the use of your car, on your, on your tax return, on your Schedule C, which I would encourage you to do if you're using it for business, and you do get examined and you do not produce the mileage documentation when they ask you for it, they will just disallow all of it. And there's no further conversation that we can really have about it because they, it, the, the fancy term for the use of your car in business is called listed property. And all that means is that it's your personal asset and the IRS wants to know and wants you to document how you're using your personal asset as a tax deduction. And so we have an obligation to demonstrate that to them by use of a contemporaneous mileage log. Now, having said all that, I will tell you that the vast majority of my clients, I believe, do not keep a mileage log. And that's okay. I'm never going to ask them for it. I'm just going to tell them what the requirements are, and they can decide to roll the dice on that. Um, you know, there are certain habits you want to get into, particularly on a Schedule C. Um, Schedule C is one of those documents or one of those uh, schedules on an individual tax return that I believe elevates your risk of an exam. So since we're talking about that, I, you know, it's my understanding that the risk of an exam for any of us right now is a lot less than 1%, just given all, you know, given all the circumstances. Um, I believe a Schedule C will probably raise that risk to just over 1%. And 1% does not sound like a very large number. And I absolutely agree, it is not a large number until you realize there's over 100 million tax returns filed in this country every year. Now 1% is a bigger number. Um, I don't tell you that to discourage you from using Schedule C. If we have to use Schedule C, we use Schedule C. I just tell you that so that you understand there are certain habits you want to get into to make sure that we are secure in the uh, in the deduction that we want to take. And that's really, you know, that that's up to us to get into certain habits to make sure that we keep the invoices that, you know, we, we document the five W's, who, what, when, where, why. You know, show us, if I'm the IRS examiner, show me why this was an ordinary, necessary, and reasonable business expense. And you're fine. And that's it. Um, I don't want anyone losing any sleep over it. It's just, it's, it's not worth it. It's just taxes. But if we get into certain habits and we can show that we're organized, you'll be fine. Um, you know, remembering that the IRS doesn't just knock on your door and they just show up, hey, I'm here for an audit. It doesn't work like that. Um, 
you know, the good news for them, the bad news for us is that it doesn't cost them more than, you know, than a postage stamp to send a letter to you and just saying, hey, we're looking at your return. Can you send us documents for Schedule C? And that's it. It costs them nothing. So it's an easy target, I guess is my point. So just be prepared. That's all. Um, so again, going back to what we would accumulate on Schedule C, you probably would receive 1099s in your Social Security number. Keep all that together. If you didn't receive 1099s, but you knew you received checks, you know, go back to your bank statements, isolate all those deposits, be able to, um, you know, just be able to accumulate all the income that you that you were able to, um, whether deposit or even if you didn't deposit it, keep track of it, keep a record of it. You know, it is not likely you get examined, but in the event that you do, you just want to show an IRS examiner that you are organized, that you have a process, the process is consistent, and that often gives them a sense of comfort that you know what you're doing, that they don't have to look much further. And that's really what we're trying to do there. Uh, what else did I want to address on that? Are there any questions? I know there's a lot of information on self-employment income and I probably went quickly, but I just want to take a breath and see if I can answer any questions about it so far. Yes. Yes, hi. Oh, hi. hi, great. Real quick. Um, I have not done that. I guess it's that SC self-employment tax a 940 or 941. I simply have an S corp and was told many years ago not to do that. So at the end of the day, um, what is the procedure? I know I'm supposed to quote, take a salary or take a share, but at the end of the day, I have a business account, of course, and a personal. And um, sometimes I transfer money out of my business into my personal and vice versa. Okay, that's a great question. And we'll, we'll spend a couple of minutes on it right now. Um, so when you have an entity such as an S Corp, which I'm a fan of, I'm also an S Corp, um, you, you don't file a Schedule C on the individual return. You, you have a separate entity return. As, as an employee of your S Corporation, because you are presumably providing services to your S Corporation, um, the expectation from the Internal Revenue Service is that you are going to pay yourself a reasonable salary and pay in the payroll tax associated with that salary. That salary is deductible by the corporation, but of course it's includable on your tax return on, on the Form W-2 that we discussed previously. So those 940 and 941 payments that you that you brought up, those are the payroll tax returns that you file quarterly with the IRS to show what the payroll was during that quarter. The 940 is the unemployment tax return. So when you do have employment, you file an unemployment tax return for both the federal government and for the state of Florida. Um, but those, those are the forms that put you in compliance with, with payroll. So you know, the, the reason you must do payroll in your subchapter S corporation is because the flow through income, because remember the subchapter S is a flow through entity, meaning that the subchapter S does not pay income taxes. Whatever the taxable income is of your entity flows through to the shareholder, presumably that's you. So what the IRS knows is that the taxable income that flows over to your personal return is free of the self-employment tax which is different than your Schedule C on your personal return. That income is subject to both income tax and self-employment tax, while the subchapter S corporation flows through to you subject only to income tax. So as a measure of tax avoidance, many of us would look to the S corp and just flow the income over and not pay any of the self-employment tax on it. And the IRS called us out on it. I said, you can't do that. We expect you to take reasonable compensation you will pay payroll tax on it and we'll get along you know, fed fabulously afterwards. But that, that is a requirement and that's something we can talk about separately if you, if you need to further that conversation. Did I answer your question, Kathy? You did, except for the fact that uh, it's been about over nine years and three CPAs that I'm on and I kept saying, how come I'm not doing it? They said you didn't make enough money in the early years and I don't know that I need to start this year as of never paying the payroll tax. You know what I mean? And it's not like I've been making thousands and thousands of dollars. So. I, I understood. And then, so there's some questions I would ask specifically, but that we, we can talk about that. Okay, also. thank so you. Just, just have a conversation with thank you. you so much. You're, you're amazing with the presentation. I'm going back on mute. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Feeling the love, feeling the love. Um, any other questions before I move on? 
Yeah, markets, Joe, again. Uh, you had mentioned the mileage log as being one way to deduct a car. Did you mention the second way? I did not mention the second way. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I apologize. I, uh, I, I skipped right over that. Yes. So thank you, Joe. The, um, so either way, the mileage log is going to be important. So there, actually, now that I think about it, I don't even think I mentioned either way. So there's two ways. The first way, the easier way, is the IRS gives us what's called a standard mileage deduction. And all that that means is that you would accumulate all the miles that you drove for business purposes and multiply it out. I think in this year, I don't know if it's 53 or 54 cents a mile, whatever it is, you, 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 would, you would take that and that would be your deduction for the use of the car. So the only documentation really required to do that is the mileage log because you're just gonna take the standard mileage rate that the IRS allows us and deduct that. That standard mileage rate includes everything. It includes gas, it includes repairs, it includes depreciation on the car, uh, upkeep, it might, maybe even insurance, I, I don't remember exactly. But anyway, it, it encompasses all of that into one standard mileage rate. And then there's nothing more you need to document other than the, the mileage, the business use of the car. The second way is to use actual expenses. And so, you know, there's often some confusion about that from taxpayers. And, and so, for example, a taxpayer may, you know, pay the, let's say they have a payment on the car. They bought the car and they're paying it out over four years. And so there's a tax, there's a um, payment on the car. So they'll pay it out of their, out of their company. They'll pay for gas. They'll pay for repairs. They'll pay for whatever it is associated with the car. Uh, and then what we do is we look at the relationship, the ratio of business miles to total miles. So if they drove 2,500 business miles for the year against 10,000 total miles for the year, we'll take 25% of the actual expenses. Now, having said that, when we talk about the payment, if you're making a car payment, the entire car payment is not actually what we should be including in that only the interest on it because what you are also going to be allowed is some level of depreciation. There is depreciation allowed on the car. There's, there's a, there's a uh, depreciation guide that we would use based upon the type of car and, and, and whatnot, but there, there's the, the tax code has special depreciation rules for automobiles. And there's a difference if, you know, based on gross vehicle weight, if it's over 6,000 pounds gross vehicle weight versus a luxury versus less than that, so there's different parameters for that, but that, you know, we, to do this right, you know, which is subject to interpretation, but to do it correctly, we would isolate the interest portion and then accumulate repairs, maintenance and gas and things like that to determine a business use of the car and depreciation. Um, what about leasing a car? So you can lease the car, absolutely. We can put that through your LLC or your, your, your self-employment uh, schedule, Schedule C. Um, depending upon the value of the car, the value of lease, there's a, a, a fancy term called the lease inclusion that we would have to put back as income because the IRS has limitations in terms of car values. And so, you know, if you're, you have a $900 monthly payment on your lease, the IRS is not going to allow $900 per, you know, per month on that as far as a deduction. What I often do just to avoid the complications of the lease inclusion is I'll say, look, we know that 100% of your car is not used for business because you use it to go out for food shopping, you use it personally. So I probably suggest some, you know, some relationship to what you're using, you know, business versus personal. And if your mileage log supports a high enough number, we'll use the mileage log. Um, if they're not keeping one, I'll say, look, let's just go 70% or 75% and use something reasonable. Uh, again, you know, we want to make sure it's something you can feel secure with. But anyway, Joe, going back to your initial thought, thank you. Yeah, it is the, the two differences are using the standard mileage versus using actual expense. What you also need to know about that is if in the first year of your filing a Schedule C, let's say you make the decision to do uh, standard mileage, you must continue to do that for the life of the car year over year until you get another car. So once you make a selection, you can't change it. So you can't do standard mileage one year and then actual expense the next year. It's an odd quirk in the, you know, in the IRS rules, but that's the way it is. Um, Thanks. Did I answer your question? Yep, you sure did. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you for reminding me. I apologize for that.
Any other questions on self-employment income before I move on? Okay. How are we doing on time? We're doing, okay, great. Um, capital gains. So capital gains and capital, so capital gains and capital losses are a component of income that work with, within each other. Um, so for example, so what is a capital gain? A capital gain is the extinguishment of an asset. Maybe it's stock, maybe it's real property. Um, some other capital asset could be a commodity, whatever it might be. Let's use stocks. I think stocks are the easiest examples. So when you sell a stock, let's say you sell it for a gain, we have to pay a tax on that gain. There are two types of gains. There are long-term capital gains and there are short-term capital gains. Short-term capital gains means very simply that you've held the asset for less than one year. The tax rate on paying paying the tax on the short-term capital gain after you've offset any short-term capital losses is going to be taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. When you have a long-term capital gain, so let's use an example. We bought Amazon stock. You bought it for a thousand bucks. That's your basis in the stock. You sold it for two thousand. You're going to pay a tax on the differential on the on that thousand dollars. All right. You held it for sixteen months. That qualifies as long-term capital gains treatment. Without getting into AMT issues or anything like that, we assume that we can go ahead and take a long-term capital gains rate, which is typically 15% unless you are taxed at the highest marginal income tax rate, which is 37%. If you are in that 37% marginal tax bracket, then we have a 20% uh, capital gains tax rate. Capital gains are, 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 can be offset with capital losses. We often, um, you know, financial advisors usually refer to this as harvesting losses at the end of the year to see if there's any loses in your portfolio. They will offset against your capital gains to help reduce your income tax on that. All right, capital losses can be offset against capital gains, but not against ordinary. If you have a capital loss, um, you are only allowed to take capital losses up to $3,000 per year, that is it. If you have a large capital loss in, in the current year, let's say you have a $50,000 capital loss in this year, you will take 3,000 of it and you will carry forward the remaining 47,000 until you use it or until you have a capital gain that you can offset against it. Um, as far as the, you know, most of my clients for their capital gain and capital loss situations have brokerage statements that come in from their financial advisors that basically indicate capital gains and capital losses on there. And that, that's the document that we use. But there are other examples of, of capital gains and losses that don't go through your brokerage. If you sold real property, for example, or if you sold your business, um, you know, those, those will take a different type of reporting, uh, but you will either let your accountant know that or you'll, you'll provide them. Um, if you sold, let's say your business, you'll provide the, the sales agreement or the stock purchase agreement. Um, you know, the accountant will work with you to determine what your basis in that was, if you have basis in it, which again, uh, kind of falls outside what we're talking about today. Um, any questions on documenting capital gains, capital losses, make sure we understand what is defined as, a ca as, as capital gains. You guys are bright. You guys know, you guys all get your CPA license today. This is done. All right. So we've talked about the lion's share of the income. I mean, for the most part, I think most of the income that we talked about are things that I think the majority of you would be familiar with and, and have recurring. Um, we didn't go too much into, you know, flow through income. That's kind of a separate discussion, but flow through income, meaning if you, um, you know, you have your S corporation or if you are a member in limited liability or multi-member limited liability company or a partnership or real estate holding, whatever, you know, flow through income, you know, that, that doesn't have withholdings. Uh, it's not subject to any kind of withholding tax. Um, so that's where your planning comes in with your accountant as far as making sure that you are making uh, appropriate estimated tax payments to avoid penalty for underpayment of tax. Those, you know, those are all um, planning issues that, you know, if you have questions about that, we can talk about that separate from this uh, presentation today. I want to talk a little bit about deductions um, and what, what kind of deductions are available and how we arrive at, at adjusted gross income. I'm not going to go through all of these, but there's a few that kind of stood out to me that I wanted to uh, just kind of make sure we did address. Um, 
So I want to talk about self-employed medical insurance premiums. I think that there's a, there's, I often get questions about how that works and, and what that's about. So halfway down the page, I have self-employed medical insurance. So if we define self-employed and self-employment uh, under the two components that we actually talked about today, one is if you file a Schedule C versus if you are the sole shareholder or at least a 2% or more shareholder in your S Corp or a 2% or more member in your limited multi-member limited liability company. So what happens for self-employed health insurance is, let's talk about it from the LLC, from the, I'm sorry, from a Schedule C, a sole proprietor, which can also be a single member LLC. The, the self-employment health insurance, for us to deduct it, okay, it, it, we have to have sufficient self-employment income. So let's use numerical examples. Let's say our self-employed health insurance premium is $10,000 for the year. For us to get the deduction on our on page one of our tax return, okay, meaning we're not itemizing our deductions to get it. We'll talk about itemized deductions momentarily. To get self-employed medical insurance deduction, we have to have at least had enough self-employed self-employment income. So if we use the $10,000 example, that's our premium. We need to make sure that we're paying at least $10,000 in our self-employment income because that's how it works. It's going to be based upon what you as the taxpayer paid in self-employment income. So if you paid enough self-employment income, you can fully deduct the $10,000, but it is not a deduction against self-employment income. That is an important caveat. So it does not reduce self-employment income. It does not reduce self-employment tax. It does reduce income tax. So it is an adjustment from adjusted gross income to taxable income, okay? Not an adjustment to reduce your self-employment income, all right? So that is the simple way to manage that if you are a Schedule C filer and it's, or you're limited single member limited liability company. If you've paid it enough, if you're gonna, if you have enough self-employment income and your health insurance premium is at or below that, you can fully deduct it on page one of your tax return. If you're a subchapter S corporation and you have self-employment and you, and you have health insurance that you are deducting because it's paid by your S corp, the way the IRS wants you to treat that is that amount has to be included on your W-2, all right? So if you have $10,000 of health insurance premium that was paid through your S corp, we include that $10,000 on box one of your W-2. Box one of your W-2 is the, is, is the taxable wages. It is not subject to the payroll tax. So it is not included in box three or box five of your W-2, which is social security wages or, Med or uh, Medicare wages, just box one. So the way it gets deducted is it gets included there, it shows up on box 14, which is not something we need to worry about here, but just by way of example and how it's done correctly, shows up on box 14 of your W-2, indicates you know, shareholder health insurance for 2% you know, or more shareholder. So that flows through on your W-2, it shows, so it, that's how it gets deducted from the corporation. So it, it actually reduces taxable income from the S corp that flows over the individual. On your personal return, Yes, it's showing up on your W-2, but then it is also deducted as self-employment, self-employed medical insurance premiums. So the net effect is your corporation got a deduction for it and you did not pay any income tax on it. But you have to go through those hoops. That's the gyration you have to go through to make sure that you've done that correctly. Any questions on that that I can try and bring some clarity to? I mean, I, I hope I explained it well. It's, it's a little bit convoluted. Um, okay, self-employment tax is another deduction that um, when you are self-employed and we file the Schedule C that we've been discussing, we talked about that you will pay 15.3% of your self-employment income as self-employment, you know, as, as tax for self-employment income. You do get a deduction for half of it. So if you remember correctly, in the example we talked about on your wages on your W-2, where you're paying half and the employer is paying half, this is how you kind of get, you know, some level of equity for that, if you will, is you get a reduction in your gross income to get the taxable income for that, you know, for the amount that you've paid. So you're still gonna pay the full amount, but your deduction, you'll get a deduction for your taxable income 
uh, on the self-employment tax. And then I think the last thing I wanted to address on the deductions that arrive at adjusted gross income is alimony. So for many, 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 many years, alimony was deductible by the payor and includable as income to the recipient. That has changed. It is no longer deductible by the, by the payor, nor is it includable in the recipient, you know, to the recipient anymore. Um, I don't know what the motivation for that was. I'm, I, I have no feel whether that was good law or bad law. That's just a change after many, many years of doing it that way. So basically um, anything prior to December 31st, 2018, grandfathered in, you can still deduct the alimony payments uh, and the recipient has to include them as income uh, for alimony. Anything after that is not included on the tax return for either case. Any questions so far? Mark, so when you say it's, it's grandfathered in, so if you're under an agreement for many, many years and you're still paying alimony, are you able to deduct that alimony or is it just new alimony agreements uh, you get into? Exactly what you said, Charles. You are, if you are, grand, so if you have an agreement, if you, if, if you were, if you have an alimony agreement in effect since 2015, you are still allowed to deduct that. And in fact, what's interesting on the new tax forms, or at least on the, uh, at least on the inputs, we as a preparer, and I suspect if you prepare your own return, you actually have to indicate the date of the agreement now on the tax return itself. Um, so yes, you, you, you do have, if it, any, anything prior to December 31st, 2018, you absolutely can deduct that and the recipient will need to include that as, as income. That's a great question. All right. Um, so basically you missed a deadline to get a, a divorce benefits if you get divorced by the end of the year, what are you saying? Yeah, I mean it's too late now. Any, yeah, if you, yeah, if you were, if you weren't finalized by by January by December thirty first, two thousand eighteen, you know, it, so let's put it this way: it does, it no longer becomes a tax planning issue in in in, in uh, litigation support for uh, marital uh, support. It's no longer a tax matter that, that we have to address for either party. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, itemized deductions. We have a few more minutes here, and I think this will be the yeah, well, yeah, let's just, let's talk a little bit about itemized deductions. So the, the, um, when the tax law, the new tax law came into effect um, in 2018, what Congress did was increase the standard deduction. So th there's, there's a couple of things that were happening. Prior to the tax law act that was effective in 2018, we had gross income, adjusted gross income. Adjusted gross income was then reduced by two things. It was reduced by a personal exemption, um, which would include an exemption for your spouse. If you were married, it would include one for your, you know, for yourself, your spouse. And if you had dependent children, it would include a, an exemption for them as well. All of those added together would be, maybe at the time it was 4,000 each on a number. It could be up to 8,000, 16,000, whatever it was, would reduce gro adjusted gross income down to taxable income. That is no longer. We don't have those personal exemptions anymore. Those, those are gone since 2018. What we always had and still have, in addition to when we had personal exemptions, we have what was called a standard deduction, which we would compare to our itemized deductions. What the tax law did, what the new tax law did was, so previously, so for example, if somebody finally married, finally joint return, back in 2017 would be able to, if they didn't itemize their deductions, they'd be able to just reduce their taxable income by $12,000. Okay, just because just because Congress said that's what you can do. The new tax law, it's not new anymore, we're already three years into it, but it increased that to 24,000. So what did that do? It effectively reduced the number of taxpayers in our economy the need to actually itemize their deductions. So the comparison was always, here's what we would do. We can reduce your income by the standard deduction, almost makes your tax return bulletproof because there's, there's no expense that you're deducting. Or we compare it to your itemized deductions. Itemized deductions include things like your mortgage interest, property taxes, charitable contributions, 
maybe casualty losses, um, maybe medical expenses, whatever that might be. We compare, whichever one is greater is what we would take. So in the past, we would compare, you know, if you had mortgage interest and property tax, it was probably all you needed and we would surpass the $12,000 mark and you would itemize your deductions. Now at 24,000, that's a higher number to get to. It's a little bit more challenging for most taxpayers. So the result of that was many, many taxpayers not having to itemize their deductions anymore. So for those that do, okay, the, the, the characterization of those deductions haven't changed. What has changed is the parameters. So for example, um, where in the past we've been able to deduct our property taxes and in the state of Florida, our sales taxes fully, now what's happened is that legislation has limited our ability to deduct taxes only up to $10,000. So if you have a property tax bill of 13 or $14,000, you are limited, you're stopped at 10,000 and that's it. Mortgage, mortgage interest, there are now further limitations. There's some grandfather's, uh, grandfathered uh, amounts, and I forget what those are, but for now the mortgage interest, um, is limited, I believe, to the interest up to, I think, a $700,000 mortgage or seven fifty. dollars I forget the amount, but, um, and, you know, either way, there, there's where that limitation used to be a million dollars, and now that had been brought down, you know, dramatically. So because of those limitations, you know, sometimes it impacts a taxpayer's ability to itemize their deductions, you know, for good or for bad. Um, you know, there, there are circumstances where if you're just getting to the needle on that or just getting to a point where, if, you know, it may make a difference, you know, maybe we look back at our charitable contributions, maybe we, we make sure we value things correctly. Um, you know, and I like to use the term, look, if you're not itemizing your deductions, it, it tends to make your tax return more bulletproof, uh, just because there's, there's less for the IRS to actually examine or look at. Um, everyone's situation is different, you know, talk to your tax preparer about, you know, how you take advantage of that or if it makes a difference for you. Um, standard deductions are uh, fluid, if you will. There's additional deductions for being over 65. There's additional deductions for, for higher deductions, for, you know, from single versus head of household. We can talk about the qualifications of what head of household means. Um, if you're legally blind, there's additional exemptions for that. So the standard deduction is, you know, there's opportunities there to elevate or increase the standard deduction, um, you know, for every taxpayer's particular situation. Um, I have this question almost weekly that I address with clients about medical expenses. And in fact, I was just talking to a client out in California yesterday um, about medical expenses. And, you know, often, um, I'm able to, to make that conversation a much shorter conversation by saying, look, medical expenses have to actually exceed seven and a half percent of your adjusted gross income before we can even take the first dollar. So this happened to be a reasonably high net worth client. So I gave an example. I said, if you're, you know, with all your income, if it's, if your adjusted gross income is 200,000, that means your medical expenses have to exceed $15,000 before I can take the first dollar. That often puts an end to the conversation because, you know, hopefully most taxpayers don't, don't get to that. We, we want everyone to be healthy. Um, but that, that it's a difficult deduction to, to take, to, you know, to, to take, but I do remind, you know, our taxpayers accumulate, our taxpayers accumulate the information anyway, you know, whether that includes, you know, out-of-pocket health insurance premiums, co-pays, deductibles, um, prescriptions, trips to the physician, there's some mileage associated with that. I think there's 14 cents a mile you can use for going to and from you know, medical facilities. Um, Long-term care premiums also under that, health insurance premiums you pay out of pocket. You can accumulate all of that, hearing aids, eyeglasses, anything prescribed by the physician that could include home care. So if you're paying out of pocket for, you know, for private duty nursing or for uh, certified nursing assistants or home health aides, you know, we can include all of that in there as well. Um, what else do we want to talk about on any questions so far on itemized deductions and the standard deduction? 
All right. Otherwise, what I want to do, um, Charles, is just skip to the um, part where I had information needed to prepare the tax returns. Yeah. Okay. So this is the information I, I, I have typically sent to my clients. I, I don't prepare those large organizers or anything like that um, for my clients. I can, I just don't. My feeling on that is that it's um, it's often a lot of work for the you know for the taxpayer, and you know the impression is often well if they can fill out the you know the the organizer they probably don't need me to prepare the return. I tend to agree with some of that, but also I, I don't want to burden them with filling out more forms. What I what I want them to do what I want to do is give them kind of like a checklist, something that kind of jogs their memory about what happened. They can refer to their prior year return. That's often very helpful. Uh, but these are things that we will generally ask for. Um, you know, most of my clients who I've been doing this work for for many years, um, that you know, we'll ask for specific documents to do this. Ben, I see your question. I'll get to that in a minute. No, I, I did not talk about home office deduction, but we can. Um, so we can go through this list. So you know, at the top of the discussion, we really just talked about you know what documents. So a lot of this covers that. You know, W-2s, K-1s, if you're members of, of flow through entities, 1099 interest, 1099 dividends, 1099B forms, you know, for brokerage statements. Um, you know, items for your Schedule C, which might include 1099s, a, you know, a, a list of, you know, by category of all the expenses. Um, I think that there's, you know, sufficient items in this list that kind of helps our, our clients jog their memory. And of course, if they have questions about it, they'll call our office and say, I don't, you know, or often we'll meet with them. And I like to go through the documents also to make sure I'm interpreting the information in the same way that it's intended and make sure that we understand what the impact of this particular document is on their tax return. Um, the final thing I want to mention on this, and, and I'll get to the home office question in a minute. So what the IRS is asking for also, we have to have an affirmative response on the tax return now on the new era of virtual currencies. So the IRS is asking on every tax return, we have to mark yes or no. Are you dealing in virtual currencies? Are you trading in it? Are, have you bought any? Have you sold any? Um, we need to be able to answer it. So that, that is a question we have to affirmatively ask every one of our clients and get response from them as far as their work in virtual currencies. So be prepared to answer that question. Um, checking the box yes does not do anything to elevate your return to an exam. It just means that that's information the IRS is accumulating because virtual currencies are now becoming um, much more prevalent in our in our economy. Um, so it's really up to them to find a way to track and to be able to determine how they want to measure uh, the you know the, the reporting requirements and the compliance requirements necessary for that. Um, in the remaining time, let me go ahead and jump to Ben's question real quickly about home office deduction. Um, and that's a great question. And so, you know, the home office deduction is, is often one of those things where I tell my clients, and, and I'll get that question almost daily. Um, it, it, my response typically is this. It's one of those deductions where I say just because you can doesn't mean you should. So what I mean by that is that if you are eligible and are entitled to it, let's look at it. Let's see if it makes a difference. The only reason I believe that we would look at a home office deduction is if we are avoiding or we're saving on self-employment tax. So there are, again, there are two ways to take a home office. So the first thing you have to do is qualify for it. What does it mean to qualify? The task force have upheld um, that if you have a separate office to go to and a place where you hang your shingle, a place where you do your work, then typically a home office deduction, you would not be eligible for a home office deduction. Um, now, I do have many clients that come to me and say, well, I do a lot of my administrative work at home and stuff like that. I'm like, I understand that. I'm just reciting the rule. I'm not against taking some component of it, but what I tell them is, is it worth it? Like, what are we really getting out of this? So, there are two ways to take it, much in the same way that we, we take auto. It is listed property because it is the property, it's your personal property, your personal asset. So we start with a very simple form. There's a standard deduction we can take, which basically says the IRS says you can take, I don't remember it's five or six dollars per square foot of the home office. And remember, it's got to meet exclusive use requirements. Um, the story I like to tell about exclusive use, and I, I'm not sure that IRS will get away with it today, but 
back in the 90s, um, there was an occasion where uh, an examiner had gone to the home office of, of a taxpayer that was being examined and they were in the home office um, and the, you know, the computer was on and on the computer were, you know, pictures of family members and, uh, you know, music scrolls and all kinds of things not related to the business. And the IRS agent just said, I can't allow this as exclusive use because you clearly have other things other than business going on on that lap, on that computer. Um, and sadly that the IRS auditor won on appeals on that. It was appealed, but, but, but the Internal Revenue Service won. Now, that's back in the 90s. So what I tell, what I tell taxpayers to do is this, you are allowed to tell the IRS examiner that they are absolutely not allowed in your home because they're not. Um, but what I do suggest, is so, so even if we tell them they're not allowed, if they're unable to secure the fact that that's exclusive use, they can still disallow the deduction. So it's kind of like a DUI test, right? You can refuse it, but there's a consequence to not doing so. So what I suggest to all my taxpayers is like, take pictures of the room, take pictures of the room with the computer on, take pictures to show the door, take pictures to show that it is basically a room with a desk and a view and a, and a chair. And that's it, show nothing else in there. Don't show a couch, don't show your children's toys or your doggy's cute toys in there. Just make it look like it's exclusive use. If you go through the effort to take photographs of it and document it with a square footage layout or floor plan, I think that's pretty good. Now, having said all that, is it worth the effort? Um, so we talked about the standard deduction. Now we go to the actual expenses. What, are, what does that look like? You have all the indirect expenses of operating your home. If you have mortgage, you've got mortgage interest, property taxes, depreciation, insurance, utilities. So if you have a 12 by 12 room, you've got 144 square feet divided by a 3000 square, square foot home, that's the percentage allocation of those indirect expenses. Is it worth it? My experience is that it's not, but other people may feel differently about it. Then I hope that gives you a broad view of just kind of what, what the home office direction is about. If you want to talk further about it, I'm happy to do so. Um, Thank you. It's no, my pleasure. That's good. Are there, I, I'm, are there any other questions? I, I think I've covered what I've wanted to cover today and, and um, I don't wanna get into everything. I know it's one o'clock so I know everyone's got things to do. Um, I hope you found this helpful. I hope that this um, just provided some backdrop for you. And um, you know, if you just wanna reach out, uh, you know, Charles has my intel, you can call me myself the office, you just wanna run something by me. I'm happy to be a resource for all of you. Very helpful, thank you very much. Mark, yes. I appreciate it. And uh, do if you do want to reach out to Mark, uh, just email me. I'll send you his information. He's always open for questions. Uh, and his office is really uh, right in downtown Fort Lauderdale. So, uh, and he likes to have visitors. So you can go. Visit I do him. like visitors. I miss seeing people. So I want to see people. So just wear your mask and know you're going to get subject to a temperature check. But otherwise, we, we, we like visitors. Yes. <laughs> Uh, this is Kathy. I want to thank you 120%. Is it possible to get a copy of your presentation? It is possible. Um, Charles, would you be able to facilitate that? Sure, I, I could do that. I, I can I email that. that. Very much. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm not as technologically sad. <laughs> I'm, I'm really rather that my 10 year old son claims to have much more technological experience than I do. And, you know, we can argue the, the merits of that, but he might be close to right. So thank you, Charles. I appreciate you helping me on no, that. I'll mail this out to uh, everybody who was on the call today, just so they can have it. Perfect. Thanks. All right.